Good morning. First of all, Happy New Year to all of our audience today. I would like to welcome you to this policy dialogue that will be looking at developments and challenges in Turkey in 2022, views from the Turkish opposition parties. Now, Turkey is always a country to watch closely, but in 2022, a pre-election year, it is probably worth watching it even closer. While leadership elections are not due to take place until 2023, there is a lot of speculation that they could take place earlier, um, so this year, or even be delayed. And we will certainly be talking about this today. But what's clear is that all decisions and policies taken by President Erdogan will be about winning and staying in power. Now, when we look back at 2021, uh, I think it's fair to say it was a very turbulent year, both for domestic and foreign policy, including the economy, which has been in dire straits and is still in dire straits, uh, the impact of the pandemic, uh, and also Turkey's relations with its transatlantic allies, which remain very strained. In 2022, we can probably expect more turbulence, political uncertainty, and rising domestic tensions. So this discussion is more or less going to have um, two parts. First of all, we're going to be looking at what to expect this year, including uh, related to the economy, foreign policy, uh, and in other areas such as fundamental rights and freedoms. Will there be a further crackdown ahead of the elections? Um, secondly, um, we want to focus on how the opposition is preparing for the elections. Opposition figures, including the mayors of Istanbul and Ankara, are currently doing much better in public opinion polls uh, than President Erdogan. The electoral alliance that was established and was so successful in the municipal elections has survived uh, and has engaged in important talks to put together different proposals and strategies. Still, I think it's fair to say that many challenges lie ahead. And we're going to discuss this today with our wonderful panel, who were kind enough to accept to join us today. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, first of all, Ahmed Unal Chevikas, who is a member of the Republican People's Party, the JHP, uh, and who is a former ambassador, including in the UK, Iraq, and Azerbaijan. Um, Yasemin uh, Bilgal, who is responsible for foreign relations and security policies at the Democracy and Progress Party, DEVA. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Selim Sazak, who is advisor to the Secretary General um, of the Good, otherwise E Party. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Just a quick word to the audience, as always. Um, please, can you put your questions and comments into the chat box? Or alternatively, you can click on the hand icon. Um, personally, I would like to hear your voices so that we're not alone here. Um, so I would encourage, you know, physical questions um, and please put them early so I can include them into the conversation right from the beginning. Um, I want to start now by giving the floor to um, Ambassador Chevikas. He's going to have about six minutes or seven minutes um, to lay out how, how he sees uh, developments unfolding in the coming months. So I give the floor, first of all, to you, Ambassador. Okay. Ambassador, have we lost you? Okay, it seems like we may have. Are you there? Yes, I'm back and uh, I'm afraid I was interrupted uh, for a while. Uh, okay. I hope it won't happen again. Okay. Uh, but, uh, no problem. Here I am. All right. So I, gave, I was giving the floor to you to kick us off. Okay. Did you ask me to start? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Okay, if you're, if you're having technical problems, then I, I will ask um, um, Yasmin Bilgal to start, because you seem to have frozen. So I will begin actually? Yes, just go ahead, because I think the ambassador has some technical issues. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think it's a great panel, especially hearing the voices of the opposition for what's happening in Turkey and the developments uh, and the challenges uh, for Turkey in 2022. I would like to begin uh, my talk before discussing Turkey's challenges in 2022. I think it's important to recognize that the world is going through actually many challenges, such as democratic backsliding in many countries around the world, rise in populism, political polarization, uh, civil wars, influx of refugees, climate crisis, and on top of it, COVID-19 pandemic that has disrupted global supply chain. And unfortunately, all of this is happening at a time when global distribution of power is changing and great power competition is right at the center of the international system once again after uh, two decades of a unipolar world. So when we think about the challenges Turkey is facing, it's important to put it into this context as well, that the world is going through many challenges and Turkey is also one of these countries that is living through these changes. And if I need to uh, begin what I see as the main challenges in Turkey for 20, 2022, first of all, as you've mentioned, uh, there is the scheduled elections for uh, general elections in June, 2023. And there's speculation that the elections may even be held this year, early elections. So all the opposition political parties, including us, Democracy and Progress Party, we're preparing for the elections in case, uh, if and when uh, the elections are held this year. So it's a very strategic year uh, for Turkey. When we look at the challenges, I think right now everyone's talking about the economic problems of Turkey due to the fact uh, the weak Turkish lira, the Turkish lira, as losing historical value, the high rates of inflation, high unemployment rate, and the increase in poverty and economic inequality. There, there exists much instability and volatility in the Turkish economy. But when we look at the economic challenges Turkey is facing, which looks like it's going to be facing in 2022 as well, it's important to correctly identify the root cause of the economic challenges Turkey is facing. Because one thing we need to be clear that the root cause of the economic problems Turkey is facing is not really economic, but political. Once we identify the root cause, then we can also discuss uh, what the solution for Turkey's economic problems are. Because the reason why I state it's um, political, because over the years, especially with the 2017, April 2017 referendum that changed the governance from a parliamentary system to a presidential, uh, executive presidential system, uh, Turkey's economic problems has actually worsened. So we can easily see that Turkey's economic problems lies with the system, uh, first of all. So as long as Turkey remains under this partisan presidential system of governance, uh, it's not going to be possible to resolve Turkey's economic problems. Secondly, we're seeing the erosion of the rule of law, uh, institutions, including economic institutions, losing uh, their independence, and the retreat from democracy. So when we can identify the root cause of the economic problems as political, a system problem, as well as decision-making process. Because uh, the, the chair of our political party, Ali Babacan, was a minister of economy from 2002 to 2007, and then after the global financial crisis from 2009 to 2011. So when we look at, for example, the economic growth rate of Turkey during Ali Babacan's years, it was on average 7.3%. But when we look at since 2017, when Turkey shifted from a parliamentary system to a partisan uh, presidential system, actually the economic growth rate has decreased to 3.6% on average. So we can actually clearly see when we look at the graphically, numerically, uh, how the system change has actually worsened uh, Turkey's economic problems. And in order to restore uh, and resolve Turkey's economic problems, really uh, the solution lies in system change, establishing rule of law and restoring democracy. So it's, we need to think of the economic problems as a problem of democracy as well. Um, restoring trust and credibility and an independent judicial system because without the rule of law, it's not gonna be possible for domestic investors or foreign investors to see the Turkish market is a reliable uh, market which they can trust. So uh, this is where I would like to uh, begin the economic challenges Turkey is facing. So the solution really, rely, uh, the solution lies uh, in the political solution. So we believe, for example, as Democracy and Progress Party, 
the economic challenges is not gonna be resolved under this political system. So change uh, in the presidential system to a parliamentary system is a prerequisite. Establishing the rule of law and trust and credibility of Turkey is essential, mm -hmm. is a prerequisite for uh, Turkey to resolve the economic issues. And it's important to also point out that even though Turkey is going through dire economic situation, it's also easily to can recover from this uh, economic downfall as long as uh, right decision-making process is established because right now it's really President Erdogan and his close associates uh, are leading the uh, economy. Uh, earlier on, under, actually under this political party, for example, when our chair was the Minister of Economy, the decision-making process was very different. It was by consultation and consensus building. So the decision-making process, the system problem, and the mentality problem, strengthening the institutions, consensus building, is crucial uh, for Turkey to resolve its economic problems. And Turkey has a great potential. I mean, it has a young population, entrepreneurial uh, business world, uh, a vibrant workforce. So as long as civil liberties are established, rule of law is restored and democracy, the retreat from democracy is reversed, there's no reason why Turkey should not have a strong, sustainable and inclusive economy. So this is one of the challenges, economic challenges that I do not see that as long as this, uh, this governance, bad governance and decision-making process changes, that in 2022, the economic problems of Turkey can be resolved. So I would like to come to what we are doing at Democracy and Progress Party for 2022, since also we're one of the main uh, opposition parties in Turkey. Uh, I think it's important because elections is really at the top of everyone's mind when, when they're talking about Turkey. Uh, and it's gonna be an inspirational election because it's gonna be an exemplary election for the rest of the countries that are dealing with the authoritarian turn and rise in populism and political polarization. So we're a newly founded party. party. We were founded two years ago, March 2020, 2020, and it's gonna be two years just in two months. So our goal for 2022 is first of all, to reach to the Turkish citizenry and explain our party program, uh, our party principles. We're going from town to town, city to city, to explain our party program, why we founded this political party, because there are many opposition parties in Turkey, why there was a need for the Democracy and Progress Party. And I would also like to uh, mention that many see the Turkish elections, the upcoming general elections, as the election to defeat Erdogan. And I think that's a wrong approach in a way to see the general elections. What really matters, uh, what all the opposition parties should be doing, including us, is to lay out an alternative vision for the future of Turkey. Because focusing on Erdogan and focusing on defeating Erdogan is not a very productive uh, strategy for the opposition parties. So what needs to be done is to lay out an alternative vision for the future and lay out in detail how the opposition party will rule uh, once it wins the elections. Of course, if it wins the elections, the natural outcome will be the defeat of Erdogan and AK Parti, uh, and AK Parti Justice and Development Party. So we're working uh, as Democracy and Progress Party on itemized action plans in all areas of governance, from economy to education, to environmental policy, to foreign affairs and security, to digital transformation and technology. We actually prepared 20 itemized action plans that lay out what we're gonna do when we rule Turkey the first 90 days and the first year. We have meticulously even calculated the budget for all the itemized actions that we have prepared. And we're publicly sharing these action plans. We already shared five action plans in agriculture, in social policy, digital transformation and technology, mm -hmm. uh, disaster management, and the transition uh, mm -hmm. to democracy, to full democracy from the presidential strengthened parliamentary system. So I think it's important to point out here that these itemized action plans is especially crucial for the citizenry to be able to imagine what, uh, what governance will look like, for example, under democracy uh, and progress party. Lastly, uh, the general elections is also about coalition building and collaboration. Uh, since the representative from Republican People's Party and Good Party are also here, for example, six opposition parties have collaborated recently for months 
on the basic principles of the new strengthened parliamentary system that all these six parties agreed upon. So this collaboration and dialogue between the opposition parties is also crucial preparation for the upcoming elections. And we already agreed on the principles. Now the next step will be to agreeing upon the roadmap once the election is won, because the, the newly elected presidents will have all this extensive power. So we need to make sure that the newly elected uh, president will give up these powers and will change the system to a parliamentary system with separation of powers, with checks and balances, et cetera. So now the next step is to prepare that roadmap uh, for, the, for the change in the system. So for, for our party, the priority is really to publicize our action plans, uh, to reach out to the citizenry, and also change the style of politics in Turkey, because for a long time, polarization has been the main uh, road that the incumbent government has ruled Turkey. So we're very much uh, advocating a unifying style of politics versus dividing and polarizing style of politics. So the priorities uh, for, for the next months will be really collaborating and being in dialogue with other opposition political parties and also to get our voice heard as a newly founded party and explain our uh, itemized action plans in all areas uh, of action. Thank you very much, um, Yasemin, for laying out your um, views. I'm sure we're going to come back with some questions um, later on. Um, I now want to hand the floor to Ambassador Chevikus. You, is your connection restored, sir? Yes, Amanda, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, it's um, fine. Well, uh, this technological development uh, which has occurred, uh, unfortunately, is uh, a very bad uh, chance. I'm sorry for being late. But I think it was a conspiracy to do justice to the concept of ladies first. So uh, probably it has functioned. Uh, first of all, uh, let me express my sincere thanks for organizing this uh, panel, uh, which is very timely, of course, and which allows us to identify basic agenda items important for Turkey at the beginning of the year. Um, I have a couple of observations to begin with. First of all, um, the 20 years of AKP rule has brought Turkey to such a point that it is practically almost impossible to carry on under the circumstances till June 2023 for the regular scheduled elections. Therefore, as the Republican People's Party, and I believe I'm reflecting a general view of the opposition alliance as well, um, we deem it absolutely inevitable to have early elections this year. Um, president of our party, Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, in a very recent TV program said that his expectation is to have elections this year in September. Secondly, I think it is also evident from the public opinion polls that the government alliance is losing support and that the opposition alliance is a few points ahead of them. So opinion polls uh, also show that the main problem that the people face is the economic deterioration in the country, namely growing unemployment, uh, uh, increasing inflation, rising food prices, unbearable energy prices due to the plunge in the Turkish lira because uh, we are, of course, uh, strictly dependent on energy imports and uh, the impact of all these negative developments on the mid and low level income segments. Of the Thirdly, I think uh, the government bloc is not able to identify and agree on the basic components of a new election law. The MHP is losing ground and they are not sure whether a new threshold of 7% diminished from 10% will allow them to get the necessary and sufficient support to get into the parliament. The government has postponed bringing the draft election law to the parliament several times. And as we approach to the deadline, it is becoming more and more difficult. And why I say deadline, I say deadline because a new election law according to the regulations cannot be implemented in the first elections to come unless a year passes after its adoption in the parliament. So if the new election law cannot be adopted in the parliament by mid June this year, it will be impossible to implement it in June to 2023. This is another reason why many believe in Turkey that we will go to elections without a new election law. So the government uh, therefore may choose to go to snap elections when they see the timing is appropriate and beneficial. Uh, okay, well, what are the conditions of an appropriate and beneficial timing then? I think it is obvious that the longer it takes, the lesser the support to AKP and the governing coalition. 
So they may feel it's important to intervene before it gets worse and look for a success story to create the perception that things are getting better. All the recent developments, uh, as far as the intervention of the central bank to currency exchange rates, to interest rates, and to the artificial new savings schemes, such as Turkish Lira savings accounts with guaranteed measures to meet the possible loss due to changes in the foreign currencies, are all aimed at creating such a short-term success story. Now, this attempt to create such a success story is now being observed particularly in foreign policy, too. There is an attempt to convince neighbors as well as the international community that the foreign policy misdoings of the government are now being corrected. I think this is an illusion. It's an illusion because there is no attempt to correct the mistakes because if it were the case, we should have seen a positive performance in all aspects of the foreign policy, starting with the West, with the United States of America, relations with the European Union, with NATO, etc. But the so-called normalization is happening only with those countries where there is a possibility of getting new short-term direct investments to give a boost to the economy. For example, with the United Arab Emirates, for example, attempts uh, to correct the relations with Saudi Arabia. There are also attempts to make an opening with Egypt, Egypt, maybe even with Israel. But nothing is happening in the Western Front. For example, Osman Kavala is still in prison so is Selahattin Demirtas, which shows that relations with the Council of Europe will continue to be in turbulence because Turkey is still resisting to the implementation of the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, which by the way is an obligation according to Article 90 of our constitution. And this attitude definitely has a bearing on Turkey's relations with the European Union as well, because the perception in Europe that Turkey is no longer abiding by rule of law that the judiciary in Turkey is not independent is growing and being accepted as a fact rather than a perception. Therefore, I think it is fair to say that any attempt to give the impression that Turkey's foreign policy is being normalized fails to convince Turkey's counterparts because 20 years of AKP government and AKP code of conduct has created such a disappointment that it is no longer possible to see reliability, reassurance, predictability, trust and confidence in Turkey's foreign policy. Nobody believes that these attempts are genuine and that they are intended to bring a sea change in AKP's governance. On the contrary, it is becoming more and more evident that the purpose is to gain more time for prolonging the survival of the current regime, if not the continuation of the personality cult, which now is becoming a main component of the so-called presidential government system. Finally, the attacks and harassment against the opposition bloc is increasing, not to mention, of course, what has happened with the HDP, uh, but uh, it is now increasing against the Republican People's Party in order to create a kind of psychological duress. For example, the Ministry of the Interior is now instructing inspectors and relevant law enforcement units to launch investigations in the municipalities such as Istanbul and Ankara. These are attempts have mainly two important purposes. First, they may achieve a kind of provocation uh, to force the people to make demonstrations in support of the new mayors. Uh, and this is exactly what the government would be willing because it may be a pretext to seize the opportunity to declare extraordinary state of affairs. If they do, they see it as an appropriate occasion to go to elections under the extraordinary rule, which they presume might guarantee an election victory. Secondly, if they can achieve to deprive the mayors of their positions and assigned trustees replacing them, they may gain uh, and they may again have access to the funds of those municipalities to revert to nepotism, which used to be the case under the AKP governance of those municipalities. Then all those funds, of course, will be used again for reassuring a possible election victory. And I think these are the basic elements uh, and the basic observations that I would like to make uh, in the first round at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. You also raised a lot of um, important points that we'll be able to come back to in the discussion and the issue that you just mentioned about the harassment um, of individuals and also the mayor at the Istanbul municipality. I mean, this is obviously extremely worrying, um, but we'll be back with you shortly. Um, I now want to give the floor um, to the final initial um, contribution uh, to Selim uh, from the E-Party. Thank you so very much, Amanda, for this fascinating lineup and this very timely event. 
Uh, it's great to be in the company of Yasemin Minandam and Mr. Ambassador. I'll try to strike a bit of a cheerier note, not that I don't, not that I don't agree with everything Mr. Ambassador said, uh, but I think we have to make uh, also an optimistic, a cautiously optimistic observation. Uh, the opposition alliance is closer than ever to winning. The distance between us and victory is still remarkable. Um, not that you know, the polling is not showing us ahead, but because there is still a lot of time and lots of rabbits in the hat to be pulled out. Um, but it looks like this general sense of discontent is shared across the board uh, at the grass tops by the political elite, uh, but also at the grassroots by the people. Um, so whenever uh, President Erdogan speaks about the opposition alliance, uh, he likes to snark that this is an alliance of six dissimilars. I think that's a bit of a uh, thing to be cherished. And Yasir Minanam also got to that point. Um, these six parties are parties with different worldviews, different opinions about what is best for Turkey, what is the best path to reach success. But at the end of the day, it's almost this organic resuscitation of democratic cultures that these six parties, their leaders and their voters have created on their own uh, because the, the conditions have necessitated them. The problem, you know, Mr. President Erdogan um, is a very strong man uh, and you know, he, he's, his one man rule uh, is obviously tied to a lot of the problems we face, but at the same time, he's a symptom as much as he's a cause. And we need to think more broadly about the systemic problems, the way absolutization of power has also created absolute corruption of power, as the saying goes. Turkey is due for a change. The people also seem to be demanding change. It's just that they don't seem convinced, according to the numbers, at how that change is uh, to take place and when and how. Um, so if you look at some of the respected pollsters out of Turkey, like Metropol, uh, like Turkiye Raporu, these are also like published uh, on Twitter in English. Uh, there are some really interesting um, numerical statistical observations. Uh, when you poll the Turkish public on the governance of the economy, 16% is saying that the Turkish economy is being governed well. 81% is saying that the government is very poor. This number, even among AKP supporters, is 33%. Uh, but then you turn around and ask who would govern the economy better? Who would govern better in general? The, the, the public is still very evenly split. It's 35% for the government, 36% for the opposition, and everyone in between undecided. So what this means for us is that the conditions are ripe, but we also demonstrate that we are in the condition to make good on these conditions, to be able to seize them. That is the reason why Yasemin uh, Hanım very astutely described all the work that they're doing on the field. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I, I, I've seen him very frequently uh, in party events as well. Our chairperson, uh, Meral Akşener, she visited in the past year, almost all of Turkey's 81 provinces. I think there are three or four remaining, uh, but that uh, countrywide barnstorming tour uh, is about to end very soon. And everywhere she's gone, especially towards the tail end of that campaign, we've seen this very strong organic output of support. People coming out on streets, these you know, impromptu lecterns being set up with Meryl kind of standing from among the crowd and addressing them. People want to be able to touch their politicians, be able to speak with them, be able to hear them. It, it looks like everywhere, even among AKP supporters, there is a bit of a frustration that the people who are supposed to be our proxies, our representatives, come visit our towns with 100 car convoys, armored, unarmored, an entire army of people doing prep beforehand, prep afterhand, right? Who, the, the, the governing class is not disembedded from the people that it is governing. And that divide, that disconnect, has grown so remarkably in the past years. That's the reason why this house built on, set, on sand can no longer stand. That's, that's what the polls are telling us. Because you know, the, the, the way the system has come to privilege an even fewer number of people, while the burden of this system of privilege is being very equitably allocated across parties, across classes, that is being felt very much acutely on the ground. 
So, uh, you know, if, if you look at the news and read about airport operators being paid for planes that don't land, you know, toll road operators close to the government uh, charging for cars that don't, that don't pass through their bridges, right? That is not something that the people lose when they, they learn about that. It, it sticks with you. So what does this tell us? I think it gives us a reason for cautious optimism. There is no government, especially in a country like Turkey, that's not naturally endowed in the way some of these comparable cases like Russia, like certain countries in Central Asia and the Middle East um, are naturally abundant. We are a country that needs to remain globally integrated. Our main wealth is our place in the world, our ability to connect different parts of the world and our human talent, our human resource. All of that has been depleting quite a lot. Just last week, um, every week during her parliamentary speeches, Mera Lanham kind of playing on this team, uh, she's been giving the floor to the people. She's calling it the, the, the people's lecture, right? Um, so every week you hear from someone else, um, there was an, an Uyghur activist, there was a, a farmer who's on the brink of bankruptcy. Just last week, um, there was a young doctor who moved from Turkey to Britain. And some of the stories you hear from these young people, very much devoted to their country, wanting to be, to be able to live here, to contribute here, but being unable to do so. That's a feeling felt very palpably all across the community. So it's almost like, um, it's not that we need to convince the people to follow us. It's almost like we need to find our people and follow them because the movement is even stronger than we are, the movement for change, the momentum for change. That's how all these six parties came together. I mean, in EU party's founding story, there is this um, very generous role accorded to the CHP. The CHP could have chosen to not lend uh, its deputies to EU party to allow it to be able to enter elections. The same with uh, Minister Babajan, Minister Davutolo, uh, who were senior leaders of the AKP government, but who've been welcomed with open arms once they turned around and said, yeah, you know what, something is going wrong, going wrong in the system, and we need to fix this together. So what is being portrayed potentially as a disadvantage or amongst us as a fear? I mean, I also think sometimes what would happen if the elections are not held? if it's, it ends up being like Istanbul or works. But then the general feeling amongst us is we will win again, right? If there is an, there will be elections. If we win once and they want to hold another election, we'll win again, we'll, we'll, we'll win even stronger. Um, one last note, that seems to be the style and the message that resonates with the broader public. That is the reason why Ankara's mayor Mansur Yavash and Istanbul's mayor Ekrem Mimamolo have remarkably high favorability ratings, practically more than anyone in the Turkish political community. Like third place is Meral Hanım, and like it just kind of goes down from that because you need to rule in spite of everything. You need to lead in spite of everything. And you know, as difficult as the conditions are, at the end of the day, when the 90 minutes are over, we need to have scored more goals than the other side. That's how this goes. Thank you, Salim. You managed to um, bring it back to football in the end. Um, but thank you. It's for a Turkey a, event. I can't not do yeah, it. Yeah, um, I know. But thank you for a more um, optim well, optimistic um, outlook. And I would also have a few questions as well. But I want to I want to actually take some questions already from the floor um, because I see that we have some hands raised. Um, so I want to um, go to John Palmer uh, first of all. If you can unmute him, uh, Natalie. Hello, John, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you to the three speakers. Very, uh, very stimulating uh, contributions. Um, as Amanda knows, uh, I have connections with the European debate on Turkey over many years, first as a journalist uh, and uh, subsequently as the first political director of the EPC. And I remember in a very early visit to your fantastic country, um, a journalistic colleague of mine, a Turkish colleague of mine, uh, uh, 
he said to me at some point, yes, all of these problems are very difficult, but the most difficult one will be for Turkey to reconcile its relationship with the Kurdish population of Turkey. Uh, now, I, speaking from a country where Scots, Welsh and Irish members of the United Kingdom are asserting in no uncertain terms their desire for, in many cases, independence, and certainly for a much stronger federal voice at national level, I wonder whether our three speakers can indicate just how far uh, their political represent their political formations are willing to go to consider a, a root and branch reordering of the constitution to recognize the reality of the multinational composition uh, of, of uh, Turkey's population. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, um, before I go back to the speakers, I'm going to give the floor to Jamie Shea um, so he can put his question. Uh, Amanda, thanks very much. And as always, thanks to you. Thanks to the EPC for inviting me. Uh, before I put, put my question, I must salute Ambassador Unal Chevikos. Uh, several centuries ago, when we were both a lot younger, um, and he was uh, less distinguished uh, uh, than he is today with his fantastic ambassadorial career. We were both uh, uh, young officials at NATO. So uh, Ambassador, you know, great to see you again. Um, my question uh, relates to the elections and uh, Ambassador Chevikos uh, alluded to this, which is to what extent uh, are elections in Turkey still subject to a level playing field? Um, but for example, in the United States at the moment, we all know there's a tremendous sort of focus on uh, the manipulation of elections, uh, the, the different laws passed at state level vis-a-vis -vis national level, voter registration, uh, rallies, access to the media. So I would be delighted, Amanda, if the panel could give us some idea of where elections in Turkey are still a level playing field. Uh, and where perhaps uh, they are no longer a level uh, uh, playing field. Uh, so what kind of particular issues do the, ele do the opposition need to campaign on to ensure that we do have a free and fair election naturally? The second part of my question, Amanda, if you would indulge me very briefly, is what would the panelists expect the uh, international community to do? For example, the US, the uh, European Union, uh, to stay out entirely so that the opposition can't be tarred with the brush of being being sort of supported uh, from abroad, or to intervene uh, with the current Turkish uh, government on specific issues. So what kind of message, what kind of activity, what kind of involvement would you expect from your Turkey's uh, Western international partners? Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, and thanks again for an excellent panel. Thanks to you, Jamie. And one more question, then I'll come back to, uh, to you guys. Um, I want to take the question from uh, Samuel Doveri Vesterbay. Samuel, are you there? Hello. Uh, yes, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Hi, Amanda. Hi. And uh, hello to all the speakers, indeed distinguished speakers, and what a great opportunity to be able to listen to a variety of opposition parties speak about um, the situation in Turkey today. My, my question very briefly, I also wrote it in the chat, is... Um, Considering the turbulence we've seen in Turkey over the past decade, and here I, I name the violent demonstrations, the violent responses to those demonstrations, the increased polarization, and also, of course, the failed uh, coup d'etat, which we saw uh, some years ago, can we expect to see more of this ahead of the elections, during the elections, and what measures are opposition parties taking to guarantee fairness of elections, and notably in the Southeast, the most difficult part, I believe, uh, everything considered. And finally, um, is there a role of support here for international institutions like, namely the EU, OSCE, Council of Europe, etc.? Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, so now we'll go back to the speakers. I'll start with, um, with you, Yasmin, because you started us off. Um, you're free to comment on which ones you would prefer. Um, and I would ask everybody to be quite brief in the reply so we can go to a second round of questions. Thank you. I will begin with the Kurdish uh, issue, actually. I mean, as Democracy and Progress Party, we see the Kurdish issue as a problem of democracy and human rights, first of all. So our main intention to begin with is to restore democracy uh, and human rights in Turkey and freedoms in Turkey. 
So this is the prerequisite also to resolve the Kurdish uh, problem in Turkey. And um, another crucial aspect here, that if you remember the incumbent political party actually went through this peace process uh, for the Kurdish issue, but did it outside the parliament. So any constitutional change, any drafting of a new constitution needs to be negotiated publicly and openly in the parliament. So this I think is a crucial reason the lack of this was the crucial reason why the uh, peace process actually failed uh, in the first place. So here, thinking of the Kurdish problem as a problem of democracy and human rights. Uh, and also, uh, our political party looks at it as enforcing equal citizenship. As long as you enforce equal citizenship, the possibility of resolving the Kurdish issue is also greatly uh, enhanced. Uh, secondly, this is an issue that we do take very seriously uh, uh, in our party program. And the second question, the other question that I would like to come to uh, in terms of level playing field, our political party, and I think that's true for the Republican People's Party and the Good Party as well, uh, we're campaigning almost every single time and we're organizing in every time, which I think is crucial for winning the elections. And I'm sure close to the elections, there will be even more organized effort to secure the uh, safety of the elections. Considering the role of the United States and the EU, I'm one of those who, who believe that uh, EU and the United States staying neutral uh, in the elections, not taking sides on any issue is the best strategy because this is this really, I think uh, Mr. Sadak mentioned it as well. The incumbent government, Erdogan's government is losing support day by day. And the opposition, when you look at uh, all the public surveys, the opposition is gaining day by day. So under these normal, under these circumstances, it's crucial that this, the resulting success looks like and is homegrown success. That it's the Turkish people organized, the Turkish opposition political parties along with the Turkish uh, people organized um, and led this uh, success. So I think the neutral position, especially considering the conspiracy theories, et cetera, that is very prevalent, in Turkey and other parts of the world, it's important, I think, for the foreign powers uh, to remain re neutral and stay out in the interference of the elections. And lastly, this is an important question, the demonstrations and whether the incumbent government would take advantage of uh, demonstrations and potentially a chaotic environment to declare a state of emergency. All the political parties, including us, of course, constitutionally, it's the right of the people to go out and protest. Considering the bad governance in Turkey from economy, there are a lot of grievances that are bottling up in the Turkish population. But one thing we constantly, repeatedly point out is, in order to really resolve the problem, we need to win the election. And it's the ballot box that we need to focus on, not on the streets. Street protests are important, organizing is important, but unfortunately, uh, the, the protests can get out of control and the government can take advantage of this chaotic environment. So it's much better to focus on the upcoming election and really winning the ballots uh, in the elections. I think that would be the safest strategy uh, for all the opposition political parties. Thank you, Yasemin. I um, give the floor now to Ambassador Chevikas. Thank you, Amanda. Well, first of all, let me also greet Jamie Shea, uh, who is a very dear friend, and uh, we used to be together at NATO, uh, as he mentioned several centuries ago, uh, during our tenure there. Um, it's so good to see you, Jamie. Thank you for questions. Uh, and I would uh, prefer to start with your questions about the uh, safety and the uh, leveling of the elections. Is there a possibility of manipulation? Of course there is. And uh, probably the government has attempted this in the past and uh, they will certainly try to uh, renew it. But we are ready. And uh, already now at the beginning of 2022, uh, we have already identified all the observers that we will be asking to, to be assigned at the polling stations. So uh, we are ready and we are not going to allow any mani manipulation to happen. Uh, this is very important and the safety of the polling stations is very, very important and it's very dear to us. In Istanbul, we have been very successful. 
Uh, in the past, uh, we had heard, of course, several rumors about manipulation in other parts of the country, but this time we are not going to allow it. And this, of course, necessitate a very strong coordination between all the political parties which are going to attend the elections. So we will probably coordinate this among the opposition parties in the future as we get closer to the election date. Um, about the uh, uh, position of uh, the uh, institutions like Council of Europe, I think that was also a question posed by uh, Samuel Devery Vesterby. Uh, the role of uh, Council of Europe, European Union, uh, or uh, uh, OSCE uh, for that matter, or, or, or uh, other countries, uh, uh, like-minded countries, for example. I think it is important uh, for each and every country uh, or institution uh, who or which attributes importance to democracy to remind uh, the rules of the game and the importance of democratic uh, conduct uh, to the government, because the government is increasingly getting annoyed when whenever they hear about all these uh, uh, attempts to, to remind the government that uh, Turkey is moving away from the rule of law and moving away from democracy. And that's the reason why the uh, uh, government's officials feel much more comfortable to get together with those countries or those leaders who are not asking these kinds of questions and who are not insisting on democratization in Turkey. Uh, so they are trying to find another like-minded group which is not putting some pressure or importance into the democratic rights and principles. So I think it is important and it is the duty for each and every uh, Democrat uh, to remind the rules of the game uh, uh, to the uh, authorities of Turkey uh, what uh, democracy requires. Um, as far as the demonstrations are concerned, I think that is the expectation of the uh, ruling elite here in Turkey, particularly uh, President Erdogan, because he is always trying to uh, harass and he's always trying to provoke uh, the opposition uh, to, to uh, create some kind of a, a, a demonstration in the streets. And uh, that is absolutely something that we would like to avoid. Uh, the president of our party has made it very clear that we will not go to the streets uh, because uh, this is exactly uh, the situation that I have uh, explained at the beginning here in my initial remarks. Uh, it will allow the uh, government uh, to declare uh, extraordinary rule, and this is something that has to be avoided. So uh, we want to play the game according to the rules of democracy and according to the uh, uh, conditions uh, which uh, democratic rights and principles and uh, freedoms uh, uh, give us. Uh, for the Kurdish problem, uh, I think uh, it is important to underline that Turkey has a Kurdish problem, uh, but this Kurdish issue is a domestic problem of Turkey. And uh, as long as you fail to find the solution to the domestic problem in your own country, then it becomes to be uh, presented as if it were a kind of a foreign problem. And uh, when it becomes a foreign problem, uh, particularly in the neighboring countries, then the solution is also going to be imposed to you from abroad. This is something that has to be avoided. Uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu made it very clear that uh, we have a Kurdish problem and uh, the address uh, that uh, is going to deal with this uh, problem that we have domestically is the, the parliament. So the Turkish Grand National Assembly the, is the a place where this issue has to be tackled with. Uh, and uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu has also made it very clear that uh, a legitimate and a legally elected uh, political party is also a very important legitimate counterpart. And uh, that is uh, when he mentioned this, of course, he was uh, referring to the HDP. Uh, so uh, HDP is a legitimate representation uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Turkish population, uh, which has received about uh, more than 10% of the votes and more than 6 million votes. So uh, they are a legitimate counterpart. And that's the reason why, since they are already in the parliament, the address to deal with the Kurdish problem is the parliament. So A, it is a domestic problem and we have to deal with it domestically. B, uh, we should never allow uh, any kind of a, a possible solution from abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, now I'll give the floor back to you, Selim, and then I'll take the, the other questions. There is a lot to be covered, so I'll try to be as, as brief as possible. Um, so first of all, on Mr. Palmer's uh, question about the Kurdish problem. So I'm a Gen Yer. I was born in uh, 1990. So I, I see a lot of this talk. I remember 
uh, the troubled days of the uh, PKK insurgency from the 1990s, I remember them vaguely. And I do agree that something needs to be done differently. But I guess the way I approach this is that the way we have this bifurcation between this um, you know, two-state narrative where the Kurds want to leave and you know, everyone else tries to keep them in, and the other alternative where like, all of this is erased, there are no Kurds, that, that narrative, that, that, that bifurcation is not helpful. So my boss, our second general, Mr. Poiraz, is also the party's uh, coordinator for the Southeast Anatolia. We go to this region a lot. Uh, right across from me right now, like right behind my camera, is a colleague of mine uh, who's actually from Urfa. Like so we, we work together, right? And what we see there is different from what we often hear in conversations like this. I mean, I come from the academia. We have these conversations in academic settings as well, sometimes even more radically than we do in political settings. Um, when you speak with the Kurds, the first thing that they tell you is not that they want a separate state, is that they want a state that they could proudly call their own, a state that provides their children a better future, a state where they could make ends meet, a state where they are recognized and presented with the same opportunities as everyone else. So maybe in the 1990s, um, there was this difference between uh, a certain ethnic group not being provided the same opportunities as the others. But look at the setting we have now. If you're not accredited and approved by an AKP deputy or an AKP affiliated religious organization or an AKP affiliated businessman, you have no chances of getting a public contract. You have no chances of getting a, uh, at, at public employment. You have no chances in society whatsoever, even in universities, even in the media, anywhere, right? So what we call the Kurdish problem kind of narrows down a much broader problem that is not a Turkey problem. There is a Turkey problem in that there is a privileged few that benefits from all the resources, all the opportunities of the state and everything that comes with it. Then there is this broad public of us, Turks, Kurds, Alevis, Sunnis, young, old, whatever distinction you could think, where all of us are on the losing side of this bargain. And this is the bargain that has undermined the Erdogan government to this point. Yasemin Hanım got to this point very accurately. The problem we have is a rule of law problem. If we could return to a system where justice is applied evenly and equally for everyone without distinction, then we could turn around and say, yeah, you know what, maybe Turks have this problem, this additional problem that we should take care of in a different way. The Kurds have this additional problem that we should take this action to solve. We are not even there because we have not been able to meet the preconditions of this conversation. We have a very major system, a, a one million pound gorilla in the room. Our parliament isn't working, rule of law isn't working, and it's not working for anyone who is not an AKP affiliate, an AKP crony, right? So that, I guess, puts Kurds and everyone else in the same boat. And that togetherness should change the way we think about this. We think about the social contract. Um, because at the end of the day, the unitary state, our territory, our territorial integrity, that is a social contract. We fought for this together, right? So we should not pretend that this was an imposition. We should pretend, we should, we should, we should recognize that what we have is an unfulfilled promise to the Kurds and to many other people. So our goal as the opposition is to kind of fulfill that promise, get us on the track to being able to fulfill that promise, at least for my lifetime. Um, with, I'll bundle Mr. Shays and Mr. Vesemby's, Vesemby's, if I'm not, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his surname, together. So Turkey has a very strong democratic tradition. You saw what happened in Istanbul, right? You know, the government tried to force another election. We won again. Had they tried a third one, we would have won again, right? You win again. That's what you do. We had coups. We returned to democracy. We had coups again. We had democracy again. Because we have, it's, this is not Russia. This is not Kazakhstan. Hopefully, it will not be those countries. That is the reason why Mr. Ambassador, who could have easily been at NATO today, uh, Ms. Bilgel, who could have very easily taken a tenure track job, tenure job somewhere in the States, and me, who could have at least been in the States and not bothered about this stuff, writing my dissertation. That's why we are here today, to make sure that we don't go down that path. And that is important. When you look at the numbers, the Turkish public 
because of the polarization of the media, because of the narratives that they've been fed for so long, have grown very introvert and very um, certain pockets of the Turkish public have grown introverted and almost afraid of the outside world. So sometimes you do more harm by trying to help. We have to figure this out on our own. And we have the means to figure it out on our own. We did figure this out on our own before. We rebuild the parliament, we restore rule of law, we go back to democracy. And at that point, Ambassador Cevikos, Yasemin Hanım and I, we go back to competing on all of our differences. But until then, we have unity. And I think that unity is gonna lead us uh, to the solution we need. This diversity is a strength, including the Kurds, including the Turks, including all of us. Thank you, um, Selim. Now I'm going to take the last round of questions. We may go over time by a few minutes, but I really want to take these questions. So I hope this is going to be okay for you guys. Um, I want to give first the floor to Andre de Munta, who has his hand up. Andre? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Amanda. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, uh, well, Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, if elections take place this year, happy and uh, successful uh, elections. It was extremely refreshing to uh, not only to listen to the speakers, also to watch them when the others were speaking. This is particularly refreshing. You're actually also listening to what the others say instead of just uh, bringing a pre-prepared statement and that's it. And this is really refreshing, so I thank you for that. Uh, to to uh, Yasemin Hanim, uh, I have a specific question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, five, if I'm not mistaken, five action plans had already been uh, been, been published, etc. Could you maybe detail this a bit more, uh, what they are uh, about and what uh, Deva's, uh, Deva specific cure uh, on, 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 on these uh, issues uh, would be. Uh, I very much uh, liked what uh, uh, Selim Sazak uh, said also about uh, um, the uh, democracy and um, more, uh, sorry, and uh, more in particular, the, the almost, uh, if I remember correctly, organic resuscitation of democratic culture, as you, as, as you called it. I very much hope that everything uh, between the opposition parties stays uh, together because this will be highly disturbing uh, to, 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 to Erdogan. This is the thing that makes him go, sorry for the jargon or, or, or the, the, the vocabulary that makes him go uh, uh, bananas with, of course, all the risks of unpredictability and uh, emergency state was, uh, was mentioned uh, that it takes. But I mean, if you can keep these things uh, together and, and, and prove that, uh, 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 diversification is, is, is possible in Turkey, uh, it, it, it would be great. I would have a more general question on EU-Turkey relations to, to, to three of you, more in particular the stance that you have on uh, Cyprus and relations uh, with uh, Greece, not because this is a, a kind of a mantra uh, coming from the EU, but because it is key to unblock uh, things and it would be wonderful if uh, the opposition parties come to power that uh, the re-democratization, as I would say, of Turkey could go hand in hand with a, 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 a new initiative uh, and hopefully a viable one. And it may be, uh, it has been said before, it may be the last uh, chance uh, to, to unblock and to solve the situation in Cyprus. And that would give an enormous boost to EU-Turkey relations, despite of every uh, or all other real, um, all other problems that uh, burden our relations, including the problem of migrants, which has not yet been um, uh, been, been been addressed. I don't want to abuse of my time. Just it would be also great if if and when elections take place, that I would say finally the European Parliament is also invited to observe the elections. We are invited all over the world, Western Balkans, other continents, etc. And, and then people, I mean, we, we get this question from people. Uh, why don't you observe the elections in Turkey? Are you not interested? We are more than interested, but we, you cannot observe elections anywhere if there is not an official invitation. To do so. So I hope, I, I don't, I, I know this is not in the hands of the opposition parties, but I mean, it, 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 it would be also 
a, a, a good thing for it uh, to happen. I think I will I will stop here. I had many other uh, issues, uh, as Amanda uh, probably suspects, but uh, I, I leave it there not to monopolize the situation. And thank you very much again. I really mean this. Uh, the audio was important. Uh, the video was as important as the audio. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And I can imagine you did have many more questions. Um, we have a question also from George uh, Kakuris, who was also asking about the, um, the Cyprus issue, your stance on the Cyprus issue. Um, so we won't repeat that. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to give the floor to Sana uh, Guzelish. Uh, and if you can be very short in, in your question, because I know we've already run, up, run past the time span. Are you uh, there? Hello, everybody. Um, it was very perfect. Uh, very good to hear from you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Yasemin about the early election, uh, if she is thinking about there is a possibility, and uh, if there is a possibility, which what what event can trigger this possibility? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to go back in reverse order this time and start with uh, Selim and come round to you, um, Yasemin, at the end after the ambassador. So the floor is yours, Selim. Sorry. Um, the Cyprus question is obviously a very important one uh, because, you know, good neighbors that are what gives you peace at home. Um, but I guess we also have to consider that it takes two to tango. Um, there is a lot to criticize Turkey about, perhaps, uh, depending on what your perspective is. But from the same perspective, you could also criticize a lot about how uh, the, our Cypriot neighbors, our Greek neighbors, and also at the same time, our European friends have dealt with this issue. So I guess we all have to decide, right? We also have to make a principled decision first and first of all. Do we as Turks want peace in our neighborhoods? Our answer is yes. I mean, E-Party's answer is yes. I imagine all of the opposition parties would say that. Uh, we want cordial relations, good trade, um, you know, cultural exchanges, all of that. We want to be uh, valuable, uh, beloved members of our neighborhoods. But at the same time, the fears that we have, the fears our Greek neighbors have, the fears our Cypriot neighbors have, they also have to make that leap of faith because it's not gonna happen all by itself. There is no political party in Turkey that could go around and say, yeah, you know what? In spite of everything Greece does, Cyprus does, in spite of everything that has happened in the past, we'll turn around and say, oh, a clean start. Um, you, don't, you don't want to kill your allies in office, right? And kill, I use this metaphorically. You know, there are certain things that you need to be able to do within the parameters of practicality. Um, the migrant issue, I'm so, I'm so surprised it didn't come up except in passing. So when you look at the mig migration issue, for example, I've written a lot about this and I was one of the people more vocal in this debate uh, prior to entering politics. I'm still unsure as to whether our European neighbors want a solution, or if they just want Turkey to be a warehouse to keep a problem that would otherwise be their own. Um, there is a decision that needs to be made in that regard. Same with the Aegean, right? Do we want Aegean to be a theater of peace, or do we want it to be a place where we as Turks, Europeans as Europeans, could leverage whenever it suits them? I don't think that there is that solidified political stand on these questions. Um, Redemocratization is going to bring a very different attitude on our side, certainly, but that is not going to be enough. Uh, that is the point that I want to make. Um, lastly, about you know, European Parliament observation um, and you know, foreign involvement in the elections in general, um, as I said, this psyche that 20 years of the Erdogan government and its very distinct way of conducting public relations has created in Turkey is changing the way certain things that would be very mundane to you and us, uh, the, the perception in the Turkish public. Um, so if there is a reason that would be a cause for worry, we, our voters, are following the elections very closely. Our life depends on it. 
Our parties have thousands of people following these elections. The European Union, the, the European Parliament, I mean, there are lots of European journalists, American journalists, you work with them all the time. I mean, they could very easily observe it from their lens. But I think anything beyond that, that would be a very difficult political message for anyone to sell, and additionally, a redundant one. Finally, I'll steal uh, Ms. Uh, Bilgel's thunder, uh, because I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, the Turkish opposition has the cadres, has the ideas, has the proposals, all of our parties, ours as well, uh, about how the economy is to be solved. Just about a month ago, our party's vice chair, Mr. Ümit Özdali and I, we published something on foreign policy together. So instead of talking about those, I'll plug in um, the article we published and I'll be writing to our editor to see if the readership has increased this week after I have my having mentioned this year. And thanks a lot for this fantastic event. I think it was very, very helpful. Thank you, Salim. I also read that article. It's a very good one. Um, so now pass the floor to Ambassador Chevikus. Thank you, Amanda. Um, let me start with the European Parliament observation mission in Turkey. I don't think that the government will be willing to ask the European Parliament to send an observation mission uh, for the elections in Turkey. Although uh, Turkey, uh, either the AKP, the government, or uh, groups from the Turkish Grand National Assembly go to several countries for observation missions, because this is, of course, a possibility within the Council of Europe, and also it's a requirement uh, as far as the OSCE ODIR is concerned. Uh, Turkey is not very much willing to invite uh, any kind of an observation mission from Council of Europe or uh, for that matter from ODIR, uh, but particularly from European Parliament because uh, the government perceives European Parliament as a kind of an enemy. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why they will never give a chance uh, to the European Parliament. Uh, and I think as far as the regulations are concerned, it is uh, the prerogative of the governments to, to invite observation missions, although there is also a possibility of uh, the uh, opposition uh, parties or political parties for that matter, uh, to get together and to, to make an application for uh, calling an observation mission. Uh, this has not happened uh, so far in Turkey. Um, as far as the other questions are concerned, I think there were two clusters. One was uh, the Turkish EU relations and the other one was about Cyprus, which are uh, very interestingly uh, fully interrelated. Uh, the Cyprus issue is of course uh, going to uh, uh, continue uh, uh, to be on the agenda for a while because we are going to have the elections uh, in the parliament uh, in the Northern Republic of uh, Northern Turkish Republic of Cyprus on the 23rd of January this year. Uh, so let us see what the results of the elections will be. There is a possibility that uh, the opposition uh, may uh, win the majority in the parliament. And if they do, then there will be a kind of uh, uh, confrontation between the president and uh, the uh, parliament because the uh, opposition parties, if they obtain the majority, of course, uh, they uh, still want to give a chance uh, to the BBF or at least uh, to the continuation of the uh, uh, talks or the resumption of the talks uh, uh, under the ages of the UN Secretary General. Uh, if this happens, uh, then probably we are going to have some serious difficulty. Uh, the issue here is, uh, uh, I think uh, it is uh, important uh, to give a chance uh, to the uh, peoples living on the island uh, to find the solution themselves. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, last year, we have seen a, a very serious intervention into the presidential elections in the Northern Turkish Republic of Cyprus from Ankara. Uh, and uh, Turkey always defends that uh, the solution to the Cyprus problem is based on sovereign equality. Uh, and uh, if uh, we accept uh, the concept of sovereign equality and sovereignty, uh, then uh, since we recognize the, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus as a sovereign and independent state, we should not intervene into their sovereignty. And if we allow uh, the uh, countries and the peoples on the island uh, to get together themselves and to find a solution, uh, then it will be the best opportunity uh, to proceed forward. Uh, and that goes, of course, to the European Union, because the European Union, uh, for understandable reasons, because uh, Cyprus is considered uh, as uh, being represented by the uh, southern uh, uh, 
uh, Greek uh, community. And uh, the European Union uh, feels that they are obliged to show solidarity as far as the uh, Cyprus issue is concerned with Cyprus. However, uh, the uh, solution of the Cyprus gets the uh, uh, Cyprus problem gets more and more difficult when the European Union intervenes because uh, it is a bilateral issue between the two communities. And uh, perhaps uh, if we can wider uh, think wider, uh, it can only be a problem between uh, Turkey and Greece. But uh, once the problem is trying to be transformed into a problem between Turkey and the European Union, I'm afraid uh, this is going to uh, uh, lead nowhere. And that is one of the basic problems that we are facing. So the European Union also has to look at it from this perspective. And uh, finally, uh, to the future of Turkish EU relations. I think it is obvious that uh, Turkey has uh, moved away from the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, Turkey is being accused of uh, moving away from the rule of law for judiciary is not independent in Turkey anymore. So all these basic principles and basic criteria which are uh, called as the Copenhagen criteria are lacking in Turkey. And once after the elections, uh, the democratization uh, comes back to the country. And once the domestic uh, politics uh, changes, and once uh, there is a uh, respect to the separation of powers, uh, once there is a respect to uh, social justice, uh, independence of judiciary, and separation of powers in the country, I think uh, the European Union uh, will change its perception about Turkey, and this will certainly help to correct the relations uh, in the future between Turkey and the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Sorry, now I'll give the last word to, uh, to Yasmin. <laughs> Thank you. There were actually two questions. One was specifically directed to me, actually two questions specifically directed about our itemized action plans, uh, which action plans we already sh publicly shared. We shared the transition to full democracy, which was actually the shift, the systemic shift from parliamentary system, uh, presidential system to a parliamentary system. But it's a very wholesome plan in the sense that how the uh, independence of the judiciary, but also the independence of the uh, central bank and how free and independent media needs to be established, how to prevent the monopolization of the media. So it's a very uh, detailed, meticulously prepared plan for transition to full democracy. We also declared four other action plans in agriculture, social policy, disaster management, digital transformation and technology. In the upcoming weeks, actually, we're going to be uh, well, sharing our economy plan. So if Democracy and Progress Party comes to rule, what will be the things the party will do, will enact in the first 90 days and in the first year? Uh, and then, or environmental policy, because climate crisis, I mean, Turkey is located in a place where it's gonna be heavily hit uh, by the global warming. So really these, and I'm gonna be, I'm heading the foreign affairs and security uh, division at the party. So I'm gonna be also uh, putting out our action plan in foreign affairs and security. Uh, or vision principles, as well as the specific actions we're going to be taking. And I can do a smooth transition, actually, from the uh, foreign affairs and security action plan uh, to EU and Cyprus question, because as the Democracy and Progress Party, we see Turkey's uh, membership to the EU as of historical significance. We wrote it as such in the party program as well. We think it's historically significant, it's, it's important uh, as a model for other countries uh, in the world as well. And we see uh, adhering to the standards and standards of the EU in and of itself, whether we become a full member or not is, is, is valuable uh, for Turkey. So, uh, and for this high precision, I would like to briefly state that we believe that, I, I personally believe as well, any negotiation or any conflict to be resolved requires mutual recognition of each side's national interest. Otherwise, uh, you could never find a lasting solution when the national interest of either side is ignored. So our, our approach uh, to the Cyprus issue is in collaboration with the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, we think uh, that we need to be going back to the framework of the UN framework for negotiations uh, for lasting uh, peace and solution uh, in the islands. So, here, the UN framework uh, is also crucial. Um, and for any regional power like Turkey, uh, what is really to its benefit is to be in good relations, productive, constructive relations 
with its neighbors from Greece to Iran to Iraq to Syria. And regional stability also uh, brings internal stability to countries, especially uh, countries like Turkey. Lastly, there was one single question about the early elections. It's very hard to know when the early elections will be. But as the other speakers have pointed out, all the political parties, opposition political parties, actually demand early elections. And there's a simple reason for this. Current, current government cannot govern. So it's not sustainable, neither the economic foreign policy or any other uh, policies in any other area. So we're, And there's a lot of demand of that within the population as well. But it's hard to know when it will be. But there's a, uh, they, we could make an educated guess that it could be towards the end of the year. I mean of the 2022. It was a great pleasure, by the way, and it's all to be part of this great panel. Thank you, um, Yasemin. Um, I have to close this panel now, um, unfortunately, because honestly, we could go on having this conversation for much longer. I didn't have the chance to put any of my own questions, um, but I think you covered so many issues. I mean, most of these issues deserve to have a much longer conversation on all of them, actually. Yeah? There's so many things to talk about. Um, but what's clear is that this year is really going to be about elections. I mean, everything is about elections. Um, so I would like to thank all of you for sharing your precious time um, and joining us today. You were all brilliant. I would like to thank the audience very much for coming um, and staying and for putting your questions. Um, from the side of the EPC, I can tell uh, to the audience that this year, Turkey is going to be um, a top priority uh, within the Europe in the World program. We will try to do um, events and other activities at least every one or two months. Um, so please watch out for this. Um, just as a, a flag already, um, we will have our next event on the 3rd of February, which will be de dedicated to the Turkish uh, economy. Um, so look out for the invitation to that. Uh, once again, thanks to all of our lovely speakers. I hope we'll have a chance again to meet um, in the course of this year, that I may, may be able to invite you back, that you won't mind being invited again uh, to speak at another event. Um, and I wish you a, a very good day uh, and a very good week and a very happy 2022 again. Thank you. Thank you, so you Amanda. Much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.